we're just simply reenacting the same patterns over and over from our past. Do I actually want this person? Is this the right person for a relationship? And all of a sudden, if we're not careful and we don't know what that is, we go, eh, this relationship has lost its fire. And it's important too. And the reason for that is because oftentimes people are afraid as chemistry changes, they're afraid and they mistake the chemistry changing for them falling out of love. Okay. So what happens is when we first have initial chemistry, we call it NRE, which stands for new relationship energy. When we have new relationship energy with somebody that we first start dating, it's everything is incredible. Everything is amazing and intense. And our bodies literally respond to that chemistry. We have more dopamine flowing in our bodies, more adrenaline flowing. It's literally a chemical process that allows us to feel what feels like love, but it actually is lust, right? So just like you said, it's the thing that really makes our heart beat faster. It makes our palms sweaty. It makes our pupils dilate. The thing that gives us butterflies in our stomach when we're talking about or see the person. And so that actually lasts roughly for about 18 to 24 months. And just as you said, for the exact reason, it's all about procreating. That's why early in our relationships, we find that we are having sex like rabbits. And all we want to do is really just be with them and experience them in any and every way possible. Well, it's your body's way of tricking you into actually getting pregnant, right? But because after we get pregnant, we can't keep focusing on one another, like we actually have to focus on the offspring that we've actually created, the brain goes through another chemical process around 18 to 24 months. And so now, instead of us having all that new relationship energy, now we've got bonding hormones present. So all the oxytocin, all the, the, the good feelings that make us feel more like we're great friends, something almost like how you would feel for a sibling or your best girlfriend or your best guy friend. And all of a sudden, if we're not careful and we don't know what that is, we go, eh, this relationship has lost its fire. It doesn't really have the same flair. And some people will mistakenly go off to start other relationships in search of that new relationship energy. And other people will say, oh, okay, well, I guess this what is what relationships are. So now I'm going to accept kind of this humdrum, mellow kind of thing instead of looking to revive my relationship over and over again. So we have to talk about that new relationship energy because when we're in that space also, our brains are so love drunk, literally, <laughs> that we're not sure whether or not we're compatible with somebody. We actually may mistake that chemistry for compatibility, but compatibility is actually very different. And compatibility is about how do we line up in the areas of our lives in such a way that if you never changed and I never changed, we would still fit like a glove and we would both be happy and have our needs met in this relationship for the rest of our lives. So how do you then start to work on that compatibility for a long-term relationship? Mm -hmm. um, because there's going to be many elements. I call it like dust settling. So mm -hmm. let's say you're not compatible and you, you butt heads on something. It's like, well, okay, well, you still have a bit of the flutter, so you don't really address it. And so the dust kind of settles. And then a year yeah. goes by and you still don't really say anything. And that thing that you kind of thought was annoying, but you still love them for it now is just freaking annoying. Right. Um, and it starts to build up. And just like dust settling, it becomes so big it's, you can't clean it anymore. Yeah, they're deal breakers. And it's so funny, you know, I just found this meme the other day that I shared with my husband and I said, this is how relationships work. And it said, you know, early in the relationship, when you're first lying together in bed at night, all you want to do is put your head on their chest and listen to their heartbeat. And that is the rhythm that rocks you to sleep. And then somewhere years later, you go, you know, I'm going to record you at night so you can hear how loud you're snoring because I want to kill you and I want you to know it too, right? Right. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like that didn't happen overnight, right? It's right, not like you right. woke up one day and went, oh, yesterday I loved it and now he just freaking annoys me. So where's the gap? Because that's, yeah. I think, something that we people don't talk about enough about how to avoid those exactly. little things that end up becoming like the biggest freaking splinter in your relationship. Yeah. 
And I say you have to learn these things so that you can avoid what I call a starter marriage, which is you marry for the wrong reasons. All of a sudden, somewhere down the road, years later, you find that this is not the relationship for you. And unfortunately, in order for both of you to be happy, you wind up having to leave and be with other people and take what you learned with you. So these are the tools and the lessons that we really need to learn in order to avoid the starter marriage. Okay. And so what I like to tell people is when you are dating, that is the perfect time to really really go slow and take stock. And you have to see dating much like you see interviewing for a job. So if you've ever been a supervisor or a manager, I want you to think about dating in the very same way because you are hiring for the most important position on earth. (laughs) And that position is for your life mate. And that's how we have to see dating. We have to look at the individuals that we are dating as potential candidates to fill this position instead of dating, thinking that this person is supposed to be our life mate. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we give boyfriends or girlfriends the husband or wife experience when we don't even know if we should be hiring them for that position. Okay, so it's got to be like a test drive. So when we're first interviewing people, they're like candidates and you go, well, tell me about yourself. Well, tell me where you're from. And you're thinking about them within context of your employment, right? In in terms of the organization that you're thinking about having them come on board. You might like them and interview them a second time or a third time. You may have them meet other employees of the company in social settings, over dinner, or in the boardroom during meetings. Dating should be very similar to that because what you're wanting to learn is who this person is. You're wanting to get past the representative, right? Because their representative is not who they are. Their representative is who they think you want them to be. So that's very important because they're filtering you and trying to adjust while you're filtering them. Mm -hmm. So we've got all this early filtering going on and we need to see them in different environments and then compare, do they actually appear to be who they say that they are over time, right? Because people will tell you one thing, but their behavior can tell you something completely different. It takes time in order to see that. And the hard part is, unfortunately, not only do we often jump in bed too quickly, and the reason why the jumping in bed is important is because the moment that we bring sex in, all of those hormones flood our systems and it clouds our judgment. Again, we go back to being love drunk. I literally am intoxicated the moment that I have sex with you and I am not going to see you the same. So it's like going to bed at two with a 10, and then waking up at 10 with a two. What do you They're mean by that? Great. I, don't... I mean, so if I'm partying, I'm having a great time. By the time I go to the club and it's 2 a.m., the person that I'm leaving with in my drunken state, uh... in my high state, in my party state, they are a 10. <laughs> it's two in the morning. I'm feeling great. Everything is wonderful. I am going home with a 10. Okay. Then at 10 in the morning, after all of those intoxicants have come out of my bloodstream and I'm sober and I roll over and I wake up with you and all of your makeup is on the pillowcase or all of my face (laughs) hair as the man is on the pillowcase and we've taken off all of the lashes and the nails and I get to see you, all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, who are you? You're a two. You are not a 10. You are a two. You are not somebody that I would have actually dated. So we need to be able to see that person with a clear eye and sex complicates that because it literally clouds our brain. It gives us a brain fog. So the longer that we can hold out on the sex, the more objective we can be about who the person is. Mm -hmm. That's important. The other part of this is we have to know that over time, time is what allows us to see a person in different situations. We can talk about theoretically whether or not we think we line up in a particular way, but having actual experiences where we're challenged to see who we are is totally different, which is why to go back to the starter marriage, I often tell folks, if you really want to know who somebody is, divorce them, right? Or break up with them. Many people learn way more about a person at the end of a relationship than they did in the entire relationship. So it is not about time that heals all wounds or creates something different, but what you do with that time. So therefore, it is also important in terms of compatibility, how we date a person. 
if every time we date, we just go out to dinner and a movie, we're not having any conversation. How do I know about you? How do I know about how you handle challenges? How do I know how you handle being caught off guard? How do I know how you handle social settings? How do I know how you treat other people? If we only date in places and spaces that never really show me who you are, but now when we're together, I'm not dating you to just have fun nights. I'm dating you in places and spaces that require the full range of you to show up. If we don't ever exercise that point of who we are until we're already married or until we've already moved in together or we've already created children or other kind of lifetime commitments that find us stuck together, we've created a whole set of problems for ourselves that now we may be resentful of. Now we may be frustrated with. Now we may become annoyed because I'm stuck with you in a different way and I'm gonna make different choices based upon those consequences that we've already created. Ooh, that was so amazing, <laughs> girl. That was fire. Um, so I understand in asking the questions, I love that, take your time. Um, the one thing I always say is you earn your credibility. So it's yes. over time, right? It's like when you need them, are they going to be there? They, they may say they are, but time and time again, if you've asked, have they showed up? So it's kind of like over time, test, not even test them, but like put them in different situations. I freaking love that so much. And um, in fact, here's a question. If you have some animosity or resentment or grudge, whatever word you want to use towards someone, whose responsibility is it to get over it? Ah, okay. So the real answer to that is that it's both of your problem because there are three parts to this scenario. There's you, there's your partner, and there's the relationship. And the relationship is its own living, breathing entity. And it's up to the two of you to constantly work together in partnership to resolve the problems in your relationship. So I often tell people, you are not the problem and your partner is not the problem. The problems are the problem and it's up to the two of you to work together as a team to solve the problems. What typically happens though is when one of us is frustrated about a thing, we personalize it and blame the person, right? You are the thing that's making me feel this way. Instead of owning, I feel a particular kind of way or I'm having a particular kind of experience in this relationship with you and that's not the experience that I want. So we spend unfortunately too much time talking about the problems mm -hmm. and not the solution. Oftentimes when I have couples that come in for couples counseling, they can tell me ad nauseum what the problems are in their relationship, right? Because they've talked about it a thousand times. They can say, it was 1976 and you had on the purple shirt and I was wearing that and we were standing over there and we go, guys, so let me make sure we're arguing about something that happened 44, 45 years ago. Okay, so now. The problem is because couples get hung up on talking about the problem instead of we understand, we have communicated, we're in agreement that we know what the problem is, even if we don't see it the same way. We've identified succinctly what the problem is. Now what we're going to do is not talk about the problem anymore, but we're going to talk about all the possible solutions for the problem, whether we're going to implement them or not. Let's just weigh out our options and see what they are. Now, once we brainstorm all of the solutions, we are then going to pick one or two of those solutions to try, okay? Who's gonna be responsible for what? Well, I'm gonna have to do this part, and that means that I'll have to do this part. Okay, I'm in agreement. Once we come up with the solutions, we have to decide then how long to try those solutions for. Mm. All too often, we say, okay, that's fine, so I'm just gonna do that going forward, that is what it is. But because old habits die hard and sometimes they don't die at all, it's important that we decide we're going to try this a new way for a specific amount of time, for the next 24 hours, for the next three days, for the next month. And then we're going to come back to the table to evaluate how well that solution worked. If it worked great, then you continue and you do more of that. But if it didn't work, oh, I forgot I was supposed to be doing that. Oh, I didn't realize you were doing it and that didn't work. We still have the problem. Now we need to get rid of those because those weren't viable solutions for us. We need to go back to the solutions that we proposed and try something else. 
But unfortunately, what happens is I'm having a particular experience in this relationship. I don't feel like you're getting it. You don't understand it. We're not talking about the actual problem. We're talking about examples of the problem. I call them the leaves on the trees and we never get to the root of the thing. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about all these things that never actually resolve the problem. And over time, I just become resentful. I become frustrated. I withdraw. I check out. Whatever happens, we stop being on the same team in pursuit of solving the problem. Oh my God, so true. And the fact that you put emotion and you connect emotion to all this, like forget it, right? It's just, yeah. it becomes this perpetual, like, no, you did this and you did this and it becomes the blaming game. And what I so freaking love about what you just laid out is it's so binary. It's let's do mm -hmm. this. Let's test it for 24 hours. Let's come back together and let's see how we feel. Did we do it or not? Yes, we did it. Did it work? No. Cool. Move on. Right. It's, yes. it's like, it's such a business mind as well. And I love it because it removes the emotion of whatever mm -hmm. you're feeling right then, which can mm -hmm. cloud how you are approaching the, uh, the solution. Yes. Because you know, what I really want to do as a therapist is to demystify relationships. I really don't want people to walk around thinking this Disney fairy tale that maybe there's a Prince Charming out there. And if I'm lucky, I might meet them. Or there is this princess out there. It's like, no, there is a science to relationships. And if you learn the science, not only can you have the kind of relationship that you want, you can control the intensity of it. You can control the duration of it. You can control the quality of it. There is a science to every single thing. We just haven't learned how to do it. So I like to break it down into very pragmatic ways mm -hmm. for people to go, oh my gosh, this makes sense to me. Oh, wait a minute. I thought they were the problem. Wait, I'm the problem. I haven't learned how to do it right. I'm not talking about the right thing. I'm not communicating the right thing in order to get what it is that I want. Everything starts with us as the individual and then radiates outward. And if you don't understand that, that's because either you haven't learned to be connected to all the parts of yourself or somewhere along the line, somebody told you that what you needed and wanted wasn't important enough for you to express and advocate for you getting what you want in order to be happy. That is so true, how much of our past carries over into that. So whether it be oh, past yes. relationships or even just parents and teachers. Oh, it, it goes to childhood, to grandparent stuff, to great grandparent <laughs> stuff. Like we learn how to come into relationship through the presence or the absence of the people in our lives, whether it's our parents being in relationship and how they did it, step parents and, and extras, parents staying single, quality of relationship. We learn how to do it. And then as adults, we're just simply reenacting the same patterns over and over from our past. Well, you can look, how much is this person truly interested in me? Are they asking me, are they genuinely curious about me, my values, what I like, what I don't like, what I'm into? Because that's a sign not only that he's taking the emphasis off of himself. It's easy. You, any, anyone who's achieved anything can sit there and talk about all of they've achieved and reel off their stories mm -hmm. about how, you know, this hard time in my life and this thing and that thing. That's not a bad thing, but it doesn't tell you that they're genuinely curious about you. And when someone has real intention in dating, they are looking for a real match. They're not looking for you to be, imp they want you to be impressed, of course. I got to secure the deal. I got to land the account. <laughs> but is it the right account? Yeah. Do I actually want this person? Is this the right person for a relationship? When someone is being intentional about dating, they are asking intentional questions mm -hmm. about who you are and what you're all about because they're trying to figure out, is that I'm trying to use my time wisely right now. Is this someone I want to invest more in? So that's one of the things to look for if you're looking for someone intentional. Right. Um, and, and again, look for those moments where someone actually invests. Are they willing to come to my part of town? Mm. Or is it always about coming to, is it always the thing with the lowest activation energy for them? Are they making any kind of a sacrifice? Is the, is the 
effort equal? When I look at our text message chains, you know, are they, are they actually equal? Or is it, or am I in the blue? Where <laughs> it's like big chunks of blue and then a little line of gray where they That's gave amazing. me a quick response. You have to look at these things because these are the things that tell you, you know, oh, there's, there's a genuine back and forth of investment. Yeah, oh God, I so wish I would have found you at, when I was 16, because I was definitely that person that would go on a date and say, oh, he said he liked me. He said he was gonna call me back. So I would just take them for, for their word. Yeah. And I love you did a post where you laid out like, look, if they wanna go to the movies after sex, it means they're interested. Right. If they call you when they've had a shitty day and they call you to tell you about yeah. their day, yeah. but also reading into, okay, going back to even what you said right at the beginning, does their actions align with their words? And as you say, it's not, it's not about like, we have this, we have this real, idea of like heroes and villains that yeah, we need to let go yeah. of that it's not it's not about that it's just there are some really terrible guys out there there are but a lot of people they're not their intentions aren't bad they're just different from yours and one of the mistakes i see people make a lot like i don't think men have a reputation for being liars i think most, some men are pathological liars and a lot of men aren't liars, they're just great avoiders. Mm. They, they don't bring up the thing that's mm. unhelpful to bring up. They don't bring up the thing that's inconvenient or that would be painful to have a conversation about. And the reason I make that distinction is because a liar, you'll ask them a question and they'll tell you a lie. An avoider mm -hmm. will avoid the conversation, but when you ask the question, you'll often get truth. And so people have to be brave enough. And, and this is for anyone, but if we're talking about women, women have to be brave enough to ask questions that they're afraid of the answers to. But your fear of the answer is gonna put you in the way of so much more pain than the pain of the answer you're afraid of. Because now you have a woman who's a year in, two years in, three years in, and continuing with this situation that is meeting some needs, but not nearly enough to feed her soul, to make her happy, to, to nourish her. And she's now not asking the question anymore because it becomes higher and higher stakes. It gets more and more scary to ask because the answer might now show me the last three years of my life were energy misdirected towards a person who shouldn't have had that energy. And he's not having the conversation because, I mean, it's easier for him not to, right? And he can claim ignorance because mm -hmm. she's not asking me and I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing anything technically mm -hmm. wrong. I'm, I don't see us as long-term. I don't see us as ever having a family. I don't see us as ever moving in together. I don't see this as the great relationship of my life, but she's not asking. So, let's just keep enjoying ourselves, right? So you, you now have this complicit kind of toxic situation between two people and it may not be toxic in the sense that they're butting heads mm. or that they're having a bad time. They could be having the best time ever. And that's the problem. They're having the greatest time. And that's fine. You can just have a great time. But when you know that you're telling yourself you're having a great time, but there is deep insecurity in you because ultimately you have no idea if this is if you two are actually on the same path here. Now you begin conning yourself. And now that great time that you have and that connection that you have, the stage two, mm -hmm. that becomes the great kind of, <laughs> the blanket we put over everything to hide what's underneath, which is that you and I have very different ideas about where this is going. I want a family and you don't. I know I want to marry you and you are seeing this as just at something nice for this point in your life. We have to have the courage to ask those difficult questions, to say to someone, and it doesn't have to be aggressive. It could be very loving, it can be extremely compassionate, extremely kind. How do you see this? You know, I really like you. Or, you know I love you. You know I'm in love with you. And that makes me excited about what we could have, but not if we're not on the same page. Where, you know, where do you stand with it? 
Or if it's earlier in dating and you're trying to figure out, you know, you don't even know if you're exclusive or not. Hey, I really like you and I want to give my attention to you. I have other people asking me out and right now I don't really know what to tell them. And I don't mean to make things heavy, but I just want to know if like you feel the same way because right now I'm in a mode where I just want to give my attention to you and I, I would rather say to people, no, I'm, I'm seeing somebody. How do you feel about it? It's a loving, compassionate way to bring it up. It's also, there's a little, there's some, there's some stuff going on there too, because even though it's, it's honest, right? There will be other people asking you out and yeah. you don't know what to tell them. Yeah. But you're also introducing an element of like, I, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. Why? Um, so that is, and I, I always say to people, be kind in your tone, but ruthless in your actions. Be kind in your tone, but ruthless in your actions. Kind in your tone is I'm going to be loving and compassionate. I'm not going to compromise how great I am and the beautiful energy that I have by having like a diff, a, like a, an angry conversation with you about this. I'm going to be super kind and loving and I care about you too. So I'm going to, I want the best for you too. But I know that I'm going to be, if you tell me that we're not on the same page, then I'm going to be ruthless in my response to that. Not in my tone, but in my response, which is to find a path that's better for me and to not indulge something that is making me unhappy or not worthy of my time. Yeah. Actually, to me, I realized in my relationship, it's worse for me to wonder mm -hmm. than to ask and actually get the truth. And the reason being is that at least even if the truth stings more, I can do something about it yeah. or choose to not do something about it. But at least I know. The wondering to me is... There's no end in sight. There is no release valve. So I'm such an advocate for asking the hard questions. So much to the point that me and my husband wrote, I think it's a list of like 20 questions and it's all to of ease. So towards the bottom, it gets very wow. hard to ask each other the questions. And if anyone's watching one, they can click on the link below. I'm sure we'll put the link in. Um, but like the second to last question, or maybe the last question is, what did you want in a partner that I don't have? And another question wow. is, what did I, because me and my husband have been together for a long such time. Such a brave so, question. Such a brave question. And then the other question, because we've been together for a long time, it was, what was I, did I used to do for you, but don't do for you now that you wish I did? Wow. What a powerful question. You have to go in with just emotionally sober, That's right? an amazing question. I love that question. Thank That's an amazing you. question. And we answered it honestly. And his answer was, I used to take care of him. I was a housewife for eight years and yeah. you know, before I was in business and I used to put his clothes out for him every day and I used to make him food every day. So then he was like, yeah, I really loved that. He's like, I understand why you don't do it. So he's not saying you should do this now, but he's like, you've asked me the honest question. Mm -hmm. What do I wish I still had? It was that you would take care of me like you used to. And so it didn't mean I had to act on it. Instead of pushing back or making him feel badly about it or feeling badly about it, mm. I recognize it's a choice I've made. So I've made to not, I've made the choice to not do that. I've made the choice to be a, into business. But actually, if that's something that's really important to him, is there a, a wiggle room for me? Is there something that I'm just not seeing here? So now what I do is every weekend, I cook him his favorite meals. That's lovely, wow. And so now I've heard the answer I'm not going to do it. Like I didn't go, oh, okay, well in that case, babe, I'm going to quit everything and just go back to what I used to be. But I heard him. But it gives you, you know, it, without returning to that lifestyle and right. that dynamic, it also does give you a tool. It gives yes. you a superpower. Yes. Because knowing that that has a profound effect when it's done is like now you could turn on that superpower at any time if you wanted to, on your terms. Yeah. You, but. It's to know what someone's buttons are, to know what our partners, like those attraction switches are, or to know what those love switches are, is really, really powerful. Yeah. And the answer is the hard question, the, the, the uncomfortable conversation lasts an hour, yeah. maybe five minutes. The knowledge, the answer you have for the rest of your relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like even approaching conversations with the word, look, this is actually really uncomfortable for me to say, ask, mm. whatever. Um, but so bear with me for a second. Like I kind of do do these caveats so that yeah. 
because I just put myself in that person's shoes. If they were approaching me like that, you would have empathy and openness to listen to what they have to say, even if what they say is hard to hear. And the humility of saying, is there anything from your perspective that you want me to work on? Or is there anything that I'm not, you know, here's the thing I need to bring up with you, but I also want to know if there's anything, like if there's a way that I'm not showing up in the way that you would like, I, I want to hear that too. And that's a hard thing. It's, e it's very easy for us to go and say something we don't like, but to also invite them mm -hmm. to the table to have an equal say about what they don't like. That's the hard part. And I think when we do that, we're showing, we're not coming from a place of, uh, of a pedestal where it's, you're doing everything wrong, but it's actually, we're a team. And also, you know, my, my father, Steve, he does, on my retreat program, he does an entire module on confrontation. And one of the really valuable lessons he talks about in that is this idea that what gives you the, the, the money in the bank to go and have a difficult conversation with someone is what you've been doing in the weeks leading up to it or the months leading up to it. That if I speak to one of my staff and I say, Dan, what you did yesterday really, really pissed me off. I'm so unhappy with it and I'm happy with, unhappy with it for these reasons. If Dan has learned many times over that my intention is good with him, that I take care of him, that I go out of my way to praise him, that I go out of my way to uh, help him. Then when I have that conversation, he knows it's not coming from a place of trying to wound him or say something. It's coming from a good place. Especially if afterwards I say, we've had the conversation, it's done, let's move on. That also, what I'm doing there is I'm setting up a productive conversation the next time there's something mm -hmm. like that. Because I'm showing you that when we have one of these things, it's contained to this thing. And when it's done, it's done. When it's dealt with, it's dealt with. And you can expect that the next time I bring up something that I don't like. But someone understanding your intention and your kindness from what you do generally with them, that's what gives you the permission to go in with, some, with firmness in that moment when you need to say something you don't like. You have the credits in the bank mm -hmm. because of who you are the rest of the time. I love that, earning a reputation, right? Over time, your reputation will be what it is. And so if someone has, if multiple people are saying your reputation is you're really open and you're really honest, and yeah. it's like, okay, the next time I say something, if it really hurts or stings, then just know that my reputation is that I'm open and honest and kind. Yeah. And so, I do that with Tom 100%. Like if he said something to me that I feel is disrespectful or hurtful or like, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. I just go to, okay, I've been with a man 20 years. What do I know about him? He loves me more than life itself. He's proven it time yes. and time and time and time yes. again. So why right now with that one thing that he said, does that eliminate 20 freaking years of him proving yep. that he actually cares about me and that he means good? And who he's been right. with you the whole time is what gives him the credits in the bank. Yes. That's what, when you have that conversation, you're able to weigh that up against the pain of that conversation and this wins.